I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. So you want to watch a scary movie. How about a slasher? No. A monster movie? Nah. Body horror? No thanks. Slapstick horror? Nope. French extremity? Fuck no. You're in the mood for something different. Something a little more off-kilter. Something vomit-inducing. You're looking for something that's going to pull you right into the movie alongside the characters. Something that blurs the line between reality and fiction. Something that feels so real you'll wonder if it was even legal to make. Then you've got to pick up a found footage movie. Today we've got all kinds of found footage movies. Maybe too many. But compared to the long history of cinema, it's a pretty young genre. Technically, Cannibal Holocaust was the first found footage movie. But the controversy about the content of the movie seems to have overshadowed any conversation about its cinematic innovations. This movie's pretty fucked up. I mean, really fucked up. It follows a documentary crew traveling deep into the Amazon to track down a group of four missing student filmmakers that journeyed into the jungle to document the cannibal tribes rumored to live there. Despite being insanely graphic, the movie pioneered the idea of recovered footage being the only evidence of a grisly murder. Alright, that's enough of that. Let's fast forward to 1999. This was the year that a little $22,000 found footage movie broke onto the scene and changed the horror genre forever. The Blair Witch Project tells the story of three student filmmakers documenting a local ghost story called, you guessed it, The Blair Witch. After researching the legend and interviewing residents of the town of Burkittsville, Maryland about the witch... This is Burkittsville, formerly Blair. It is a small, quiet Maryland town. Much like a small, quiet town anywhere. They hike out into the densely wooded forest to explore, armed only with a 35mm camera and a digital camcorder. Digital and film? Well, we'll shoot both on this film. No one ever saw them again. About a year later, their footage was found and edited into a document of their journey and released in cinemas. It's a great story told only through the lens of their cameras, but that's all it was. Just a story. Here's the story behind that story. In 1993, Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez were students at the University of Central Florida. Both being fans of documentaries of paranormal phenomena and finding them scarier than traditional horror films, they were inspired to create a film that combined the styles of both, hoping to breathe new life into the genre. We started talking about horror films and what kind of films scared us when we were little kids, and we had kind of the same horror films, you know, The Shining and The Exorcist. So we felt Blair was in that same spirit, something that was a psychological horror, which we feel is, is, is much scarier than, you know, just getting a knife in the, in the neck or something like that. They were inspired by a lot of different things while developing the mythology of the film. Perhaps their biggest influence was the 1922 Scandinavian film Haxen, which they loved so much it became the name of their film company. Part documentary, part dramatization, the film acts as a sort of educational tape describing the behaviors of witches and their treatment throughout the Middle Ages, and the title literally translates to The Witch. My Rick and Sanchez's story about the witch, Ellie Kedward, starts out tragically with her being accused of witchcraft by the townsfolk after she's found bloodletting children for her healing remedies. Like in Haxon, the Blair Witch story asks us to sympathize with the witch by portraying the men as arrogant and violent and the accused as feeble and misunderstood. Ellie is bound and left to die of exposure in the woods by the townspeople who banish her. By the following winter, everyone who accused her, along with half the town's children, mysteriously vanished and they decided she must have made some deal with the devil to curse them. Like, like and subscribe. subscribe. When all was said and done, Myrick and Sanchez's screenplay was only about 35 pages long with the expectation that most of the dialogue would be improvised. They held a casting call in June 1996, calling for actors with strong improvisational skills. The casting process uh, was really important in this film because, you know, Ed and I came up with these character profiles that we felt fit the story and the backstory. And um, so what really what we were trying to do is cast personalities rather than actors to portray a particular role because we knew there was so much improvisation throughout the film. We made it clear to them, you know, this, I mean, even in the audition process, we put a, a sheet out there that said, if you don't like camping, if you don't like being out in the woods, if you don't like being scared, don't even try out for this part. So it was very important from the very start that we make it clear to people that this wasn't a conventional, you know, film. Out of the 2,000 actors to respond, Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams were cast in the lead roles. Both Heather and Michael quit acting within a few years after the film's release, but you can still see Josh from time to time. The film was shot in Maryland over the course of eight days in October 1997. Myrick and Sanchez chose to shoot the film chronologically so the actors would become fatigued in real time, which would make the whole thing easier to edit together. That means the first scenes they shot were the interviews with the people in Burkittsville, which, unbeknownst to the three leads, had been partially populated with actors. Each of the paid townspeople were given a page or two of history about the Blair Witch, and they would recite what they remembered to the camera if Heather and the crew interviewed them. Due to the improvisational method of filming, Myrick and Sanchez didn't know how much of what they wrote was going to make it into the film, but they were especially pleased with this line. Finally, one day, old Mr. Parr come down into the market and said, I'm finally finished. Which went on to become a staple throughout every iteration of the story. Excuse me. Sorry. I'm finished now. The actors were equipped with two video cameras provided by cinematographer Neil Fredericks and were given a two-day crash course on how to use them. 
Letting the actors be the ones who shoot the movie instead of a trained cinematographer gives the movie a sort of home movie feel, and it comes across a lot more authentic than a typical Hollywood movie. The POV aspect gives you the sensation of being there with these poor people lost deep within the woods. Myrick and Sanchez would watch the dailies the night they were shot and would make notes to give the actors the following day. The actors were all given their own daily motivations, but didn't know each other's. So a lot of the time, you know, we, we would be conflicting in, in what our, you know, what our goal for the scene would be. That's good, thank you! You know, that in itself created a lot of tension. The actors were kept in the dark about where they would be going each day and relied on GPS coordinates that were left for them in crates at each destination. Inside each crate were 35mm canisters containing the notes for each actors as well as their food rations, which got smaller and smaller throughout filming. On each of the last two days of filming, the cast were only given an apple and a power bar to make it through the day. They captured some moments um, towards the end of, especially towards the end of the, end of the shooting, where they were really, really hungry, you know, and they were really tired and were really scared. And it's all because of me that we're here now. <laughs> Hungry, and cold, <laughs> and hunted. When they weren't being physically tortured during the day, they were being psychologically tortured at night. The directors would creep to the actors' tents while they were sleeping to plant props for the next day, break twigs, knock things over, shake their tent, and perhaps most creepily, play children's laughter from boomboxes all around the campsite. You hear that baby scream? Yeah. Shh, shut the fuck up. There's no fucking baby out there. Man. There's no fucking baby out there. When filming was finished, the two directors began the long process of editing down their 20 hours of raw footage into a sensible movie. The first cut they came up with had a runtime of about two and a half hours, and it was much more like a traditional documentary consisting primarily of interviews and very little of the footage from the woods. However, when the feedback they got from test audiences convinced them to cut down the runtime, they realized they had enough footage left over to make a whole other movie. So they did. The Curse of the Blair, which was sort of a mockumentary for the mockumentary, made up of footage that didn't make it into the final film, and it acts as a compelling piece of promotional material that deepens the lore. Released on the Sci-Fi Channel a few weeks before the Blair Witch Project hit theaters, the documentary served as one of the many bits of creative marketing that led to so many people thinking the movie was real. They also plastered Park City, Utah with missing persons posters when the movie was screened there as part of the Sundance Film Festival, and they had the IMDb page for the movie list the actors as missing and presumed dead until a year after the film was released. To help aid in the illusion, they also asked the actors not to give interviews or appear in time shows for several months after the film's release. This is the opposite of what you'd usually want to do to promote a movie, but all their tricks work together to make one hell of a cultural phenomenon. The internet was a fairly new tool when the Blair Witch Project came out, and it's often thought of as the first movie to ever have a viral marketing campaign. The film's website depicts the events in the movie as if they were real, featuring the mythology of the witch, faux police reports as well as newsreel-style interviews fielding questions about the missing students, actors posing as police and investigators giving testimony about their casework, and shared childhood photos of the actors to add a sense of realism. These were all used to spark debate across the internet over whether the film was a real-life documentary or a work of fiction, and it had a great word-of-mouth effect to spread awareness of the movie. By August 1999, the website had received 160 million hits. This gave them an army of followers who thought it was all real. The movie was a surprise hit at Sundance, and Artisan Entertainment bought the distribution rights for $1.1 million. To say the movie was successful would be a gigantic understatement. It took pop culture by storm, and by the end of its theatrical run, the film grossed $140.5 million in the U.S. and had a worldwide gross of $248.6 million, which was over 4,000 times its original budget. And though some saw the movie as a gimmick or called it overrated, most critics loved it. Even if the shaky camera effects made some people sick. To this day, it lives on must-see movie lists and scariest of all time lists. What makes The Blair Witch Project truly scary is that it plays with humanity's worst fear, the fear of the unknown. They employ the effective less is more approach of movies like The Shining and Jaws where the real terror doesn't show up until at least halfway through the movie. Instead of showing us the witch in the beginning, the movie keeps the terror out of frame and gives you just enough detail for what might be out there in the woods and your mind fills in the blanks with whatever scares you the most. Artisan actually wanted to change the ending to be scarier and more clear. <laughs> But after heading back to Maryland to shoot four different endings, they stuck with the ambiguous ending. What's scariest is the unknown, after all. The actors really sell it, too. Hurry up! I'm coming! My boots aren't laced! Oh my god, what the fuck is that?! The whole movie is like a ghost story come to life with the townspeople as the storytellers. They help to evoke memories of chilling campfire stories that scared us when we were kids. Throughout the movie, all the little problems build the tension that leads to the terror. They lose the map, they get attacked in the night, Josh disappears, they keep getting creepy messages from the witch, and by the end of it, the characters are struggling to even maintain their sanity. The movie doesn't rely on jump scares or scary monsters. All these things building up lead to despair. They're lost in the forest, scared of the dark, and lose hope with each passing day. We walked for 15 hours today. We ended up in the same place. There's no one here to help you. That's your motivation. When this movie came out, we didn't know what the fuck was going on. We'd never seen anything like it because nothing had really been done like this in the mainstream. I mean, deep down, we knew it wasn't real. 
mostly. We were just young enough to not really know if it was real or not. Movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Fargo had claimed to be real stories before this movie came out. But in both of those movies, you knew you were watching actors live out their real story. In The Blair Witch Project, they don't seem like actors. They seem like real people. And because of the genius marketing campaign, it was that much harder to keep whispering to yourself that it's only a movie. I mean, there's credits to prove it's not real, you know. Wanting to capitalize on the massive success of the movie, Artisan greenlit a sequel immediately. They wanted to make a sequel to the original while its popularity was at its peak, but Myrick and Sanchez wanted to wait. Our big thing with Blair is that we would rather have somebody else ruin it than have us ruin it. And if we don't, really don't have any good ideas or if, or if they're not going to let us do the idea that we want to do, we'd rather let them have a shot at it and see if they can do something good with it. And if not, we can just say, hey, we didn't do it. So Artisan decided to proceed without them and hired Joe Berlinger to direct. The sequel, Book of Shadows, is nothing like the first movie. There are a few POV shots here and there, but it's mostly shot in the traditional way and the whole movie is sort of a meta-commentary on the Blair Witch Project. It's about a cast of characters who meet up in the Black Hills Forest where the original movie was shot to get led on a tour by an obsessed local. And they come up to me, you know what they do? They come over to me and they hug me and they say, I, dude, I know it's real, and they squeeze me and I squeeze them back and I say, I know it's real too, man, and we have a bond, you know, we have a connection, you know? So, so, and I say, I know, and they go, I know, man, and I go, I know. Berlinger wanted to go with a metaphorical message of how readily the public is willing to accept that something shot on video is real, and wanted to comment on how manipulative the media can be. Video never lies, Kim. He interviewed people who really lived in Burkittsville and used their experiences and the phenomena of the original film as inspiration for his movie. Each character represented a different response to the first movie. So we get to see how the Wiccans reacted to it, the skeptics, the money-hungry studios, and just the casual fans. You know, if you don't believe in the Blair Witch, then why the hell did you bother to come? I thought the movie was cool. This sort of referential thing was all the rage for horror movies in the late 90s and early 2000s. Movies like Scream, New Nightmare, Urban Legend, Funny Games, and Behind the Mask all comment on the horror genre while also meeting all the expectations of it. If you're a fan of horror movies that came out in this era, it's worth checking out. We actually have a video on slashers that goes deep into why these movies are so meta. If you'd like to check that out, click the link above. Berlinger wanted to make a movie about characters psychologically unraveling after experiencing some really weird shit in the Black Hills. They all wake up after a night none of them remember and start investigating the footage they shot that night. The rest of the movie is just them trying to figure out if what's on the tapes is real or not. Get it? The characters are us watching the first movie. Okay, maybe it didn't really work, but that's not totally Berlinger's fault. There's actually a surprisingly interesting story behind Book of Shadows, mainly in the way it was made and then mingled by post-production studio meddling. Artisan forced him to recut the movie and actually reshoot certain scenes to make it more of a generic horror movie. The original ending of the film lost all of its effectiveness, because instead of using the big reveal to bookend the movie, the studio demanded that both the beginning and the ending be chopped up and littered throughout, which compromised the original more linear narrative. He also had to shoot a scene with another tour group being brutally murdered so they could sprinkle in sporadic cuts of extreme violence that didn't didn't really make sense with the rest of the movie. So, when I popped this movie in, I was prepared to absolutely hate it. All I'd ever heard about it was that it was hot garbage, but it's really not that bad. I mean, it's not great, but it's certainly not as bad as everyone says. Overall, it's kind of a crazy mess and kind of silly at times, but that's about its most offensive thing. Trust me, I'm just as surprised as you are. But is it worth checking out? That's debatable. Jeffrey Donovan is good, the meta thing mostly works, and I'd really be interested in seeing a director's cut of this movie. There's a good movie hiding in there somewhere. The movie also revisits stuff from Curse of the Blair Witch, like where they found the footage for the original film. In fact, knowing some of the Blair Witch lore probably made me like Book of Shadows a little more than I would have going in blind. Despite being critically panned across the board, it did make back over three times its budget, so as far as studios were concerned, this was still a property worth mining. In 2016, Adam Wingard made Blair Witch. <laughs> Okay, what is the deal with simply ticking off the THE for movie reboots? Fast and Furious, Evil Dead, Blair Witch, Texas Chainsaw. It's like they think that little change will prove it's a new thing or something. Drop the THE. It's clear. Blair Witch is a direct follow-up to the original, completely ignoring the events of Book of Shadows, which was definitely a good idea. It's basically a souped-up remake that revolves around a guy leading a group of his friends into the Black Hills to try and find his sister who, surprise, is Heather from the first movie. Winger chose to return to the found footage format, but he modernized it by making the found footage be discovered on YouTube and by adding lots of different types of cameras. Lane uses a mini DV camera like Heather did in the first movie, but Lisa's got a modern DSLR camera, a drone, and lots of little mountable ones. This movie, like most found footage movies after the 99 classic, misses the point of the format. At one point in the first movie, Josh takes Heather's camera and he gives us this line. I see why you like this video camera so much. You do? It's not quite reality. Josh and Mike spend a lot of time harassing Heather for continuing to make her movie even though they're all scared for their lives and eventually Heather says It's all I fucking have left, okay? Just please stop. 
It's these two scenes that help to justify the whole movie's existence. We get where Heather's coming from, and she shifts from being a tyrant to being a desperate and sympathetic character for every scene that follows this one. In this reboot, and in most found footage movies, characters just keep filming for no reason, and it's like the filmmakers don't even understand or believe in the format they choose to shoot in. Everyone's holding a camera, and all these static shots get set up so when the movie gets cut together, it just looks like a really polished traditional movie that was shot terribly. What's the point? The plot is really just a rehash of the first movie that relies far too much on jump scares that might be scary if you've never seen another scary movie before. There's kids in the woods, spooky forest stuff happens, there's the retelling of the Ellie Kedward ghost story told at a literal campfire this time, and people mysteriously die. There are a few surprises to keep it fresh, like one of the stick men being a voodoo doll, the weird time loop element where people get trapped in the woods forever where the sun doesn't rise, and the ending is successful at making you feel pretty claustrophobic, but none of it ever recaptures the primal fear of the original. It even breaks one of the major rules of the first movie by actually showing us the witch at the end. And she's just the same copy and pasted chittering monster with gangly, overly long legs that's in every other modern horror movie these days. I mean, come on, it doesn't look anything like the McFarlane toy. Man, I miss those. Critics weren't kind to the movie, and even though it made $20 million after you factor in the marketing budget, the studio expected it to make a lot more and considered it a flop. As of 2021, no studios have plans to revisit the franchise, so let's hope they finally agreed to leave poor Ellie Kedward alone. Though it was itself inspired by movies like Cannibal Holocaust and The Last Broadcast, The Blair Witch Project is often thought to be the movie that popularized found footage horror and has influenced countless other movies in the same genre like Wreck, Cloverfield, The Last Exorcism, Troll Hunter, Chronicle, Project X, As Above, So Below, and the VHS series. Sloppy sequels and remakes aside, the legacy of the first movie remains untarnished. It didn't rely on the found footage gimmick that sparked so much controversy when it was first released. It doesn't matter if you know it's real or not, or if you've seen it a dozen times before, the movie is still terrifying. The performances are so real that they tap into some deeply ingrained sense of empathy we all have that makes us care about these poor suffering college students. When the characters feel real, you can't help but feel scared for them when you see them in danger. It's all around us. As time goes on and technology evolves, the genre itself is evolving alongside it. Movies like Unfriended, Searching, and Profile take place entirely on computer screens, and they blur the line between reality and fiction so well that it's hard to tell where one ends and the other begins. Maybe one day soon, the next big innovation in horror cinema will come along and surprise us. But until then, the Blair Witch will keep us jumping at shadows and looking over our shoulders when we go camping.